On today's show, Sam Merrill, career high, and the Cavs beat the Rockets 2-0 now without Garland and Mobley. We'll talk about that game. We'll talk about the Cavs injuries on a new episode of Locked On Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com backslash LockedInNBA and use code all lowercase LockedInNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damerel. We are here after Cavs Rockets. Cavs get to 2-0 and without Garland and Mobley. At the end of the show, we'll do our first kind of initial reactions to Darius Garland's broken jaw, and Evan Mobley having knee surgery. So we'll talk about that on Tuesday's show. Well, really, the later episode on Tuesday, perhaps early Wednesday, we're going to do a deeper dive into those injuries. We have not had a chance just based on some things going on for us to get to that as of yet. So we will cover those injuries. Those are obviously the biggest thing shaping the Cavs right now, and there's a lot of analysis to be done. We're going to start that today and go even further into that tomorrow. But Evan, let's start with Cavs Rockets. What was your big takeaway from a Cleveland overtime win? So this probably wasn't the most complete win in the season for Cleveland. There's a lot of miscues in this one, and also just the fact that there was no Darius Garland or Evan Mobley. Um, like the, and then just like the, the, the lack of those two was definitely apparent in moments. But I'd say this was one of their more impressive wins just because Sure, Houston was missing some players as well, but they a lot of their key veterans and then like Sengun were available and like Fred Van Fleet had like a career night against the Cavs and it didn't feel like it just because Cleveland was really like battling in this game. Like in the first quarter, uh, they came out strong and to the end of the first half, they're down two and they didn't come out slow or lethargic in the um, start of the second half. They kind of just went blow for blow with um Houston a lot in this game. Like there were moments when the Cavs really widen the lead and then like the Houston would climb back into it and then like maybe Houston take the lead briefly. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't expect if you had asked me going into this game if Sam Merrill would have been like the hero of this game for Cleveland, but he certainly was. I think it was a big part of it. Then you can give a lot of credit to Isaac Okoro who played really well. Uh, George Niang was impactful off the bench despite maybe not having the best of shooting numbers. Like, Tristan Thompson stepped up in a big way at times, especially with Jared Allen doing foul trouble. Like this was a pretty complete win for Cleveland in that sense. And I think it's impressive in that regard, just considering they are down to their best player. I I think this is just the kind of win you're going to have to get. If you're them right now, you have these injuries guys with guys out there are going to change your play style. A lot of up and downs in this game. And Evan, I would also say this didn't feel like a game in a way Cleveland, I think, would want to play it. I don't think J.B. Bickerstaff or the way that coaching staff wants to play optimally is a first quarter where it's 34-33. It's, it's scoring right at the gate, and the third quarter is just a track meet. It's 42-49 Cleveland advantage in that quarter. Uh, Cavs led most of the quarter, but it's super competitive. They shot 50% from three in that quarter. Both teams shot the ball overall pretty well in that quarter. And you end up just having a really, really up and down quarter I, that was not defensive heavy. This wasn't a def, a good defensive game really by other team. There's one aspect for Cleveland that was. We'll get to that. But this was just a game where you're. I think you're just okay. You took care of business the same way against Atlanta, and it's similar to Atlanta where they came out really hot, really aggressive, and held on a little bit. This is a little bit different, but it was a win that wasn't exactly how I think they want to play. But pr- right now, I think you'll take wins how you can get them as you're just trying to f- navigate this stretch yeah and i think that's just the only way you have to go about it they are two and oh in the wake of these in the back-to-back injury blows the Cavs were dealt last friday but they're not going to be undefeated during this entire stretch garland's going to be out for uh, at least a month and then it'll depend on how the recovery is going of course and just like is he in proper shape to be back on the floor i wouldn't be surprised if he's not it's not like he's unable to move and then like for Mobley, like six to eight weeks, that could be almost two months most. And then like he still has to ramp up production, everything like there's going to be a bit of a lull here where the Cavs are just going to be incomplete for the better part of 
this season now. And I think you just have to take this on a game by game basis and just focus on what worked to keep working on the small details that didn't. Mitchell said post game, like against Atlanta, he had a career high 13 assists. In this game, it was six assists, but it was more of like playmaking by association and kind of doing it like together just to kind of cover the absence of Darius Garland and Mitchell. And it clearly like you can't really replace what Darius Garland gives this Cavs teams in terms of playmaking, but they can make it work in terms of just moving the rock and keeping everybody involved. So I think that's just really encouraging it of itself. And again, like there were moments where I'm thinking like, okay, the Rockets are probably going to pull away in this one. And the Cavs just kind of roared back and kept like fighting and scrapping their way through it. And Houston um, forced overtime. And then the Cavs kind of just really put the Rockets away early into the overtime period and then just kept them in arm's length away until the final buzzer sound. I, I think you have seen a little bit in these two games to be um, some adjustments. You have seen some adjustments about how they have decided to play. It isn't, I think that the way that they've, the way the starting five they've gone with Mitchell, Wade, Okoro, Struess and Allen. It's smaller. There and they didn't say we're gonna f- we're gonna force in, let's say Craig Porter Jr. who didn't even play in this game or I don't played a little bit in this game, not a ton in this game. But we're not gonna shoehorn in a backup point guard into the starting role and have them and just keep things similar. We're saying we have Donovan Mitchell who's gonna play a ton of minutes, who's gonna be high usage. And we're going to simplify things a little bit and play to what we have right now. And I think that makes a ton of sense to me. I think that's probably part of the reason, aside from not playing great, great teams, Evan, that they're 2-0 without those two guys. I don't think they're better without those two guys, but I think Mm -hmm. the way they've decided to play and against the opponents they've played has had a factor in that. I think that's part of the reason why you're 2-0, you've beaten Houston, You've beaten Atlanta, and I think you have a pretty darn good chance of being 3 0 once you get to the Utah game on Wednesday night. So it is interesting because the Cavs have like an interesting slate at home of like not great defensive teams, whether it's um, Atlanta, who's uh, awful, or Utah, who has really struggled out the gates this year. I think the Sean Collins edition has not worked like they had hoped at all. Um, and now. Surprise, surprise, John Collins is in trade rumors once again, according to Andy Larson of the Salt Lake Bee. But um, then you look at just teams like uh, New Orleans, who isn't great, but like they're at least a step up from what Utah or what Atlanta gives you. And also like they have to play New Orleans immediately after play, they play the Jazz. But like this Rockets game, like you can tell like tonally, um, the Cavs weren't going to get as easy of a look at the bucket or, they were, or Jared Allen at least wasn't going to get like the first 14 or so points. In the game for the Cavs, the Cavs just kept force feeding him because it was working because the, the Hawks are just objectively awful on defense, especially on the interior. Um, and when that game came kind of clear, like the, the notion and stuff changed. I think the Cavs kind of had to feel it out a little bit. And like you said, like they are trying new things just to try and figure out like how life can function without Garland and Mobley on the floor. And they are cobbling together just enough to find ways to win. And again, yeah, there are some missteps along the way, but like I think that's part of this learning process when you are without arguably two of your most important players. All right, coming up next, let's dive into our game awards. That's MVP, that's stat of the night, and that's play of the night. Uh, I think there's going to be someone who set a career high that comes up in that segment. So we'll get to him and the other awards up next. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They are the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It is just you versus the numbers. Instead of betting thousands, battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. With basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League. That is a league specifically created for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. And you can also play against some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and the comedian Andrew Schultz. Go to prizepicks.com backslash LockedInNBA and use code LockedInNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com backslash LockedInNBA and our code LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy.
All right, we're back. Evan, who's your MVP? So I think the obvious pick is Sam Merrill in this one. Uh, I think you can make an argument for Donovan Mitchell as well, but I'm going to go a little different. Um, it's Isaac Okoro, actually. I think Okoro just had a lot of key moments in this game that really kept Cleveland alive. Like my original play of the night was, I don't think it was called for a block, but like it was certainly like a really high-end defensive play in the closing moments of the game when he just more or less shut off Fred Van Vliet's water and prevented Van Vliet from getting a clean look at the bucket just to prevent either Houston from tying or taking the lead in that moment. And like just Okoro has played really, really well and he's making the most of the minutes and the opportunities. Like Donovan Mitchell said post game, like you're starting to see Okoro look a lot more comfortable out there and he's really learning how to maximize his opportunities, whether it's in limited minutes or in a heavy dosage of minutes like you got tonight against um, the Rockets. So yeah, Okoro for me was just really impressive in this one. Who is yours? I, I think it's Sam Merrill just because he was such a spark. The fact they did 19, I think there's a couple candidates. Um, and Merrill, I think, just headlines every just because they're not winning the game unless he's just letting it fly and, and making big shots and really coming in and giving them actual minutes. That's th- This is what you just hope uh, the 14th guy in your roster who we didn't think coming into the year was going to matter at all might not have made it that far. You're hoping that this is what he can come in and do is just have a night here or there where he's 5 of 10 from 3 and has 19 points and is just absolutely an effective player in, in 24 minutes and hit some really big shots in overtime is why I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in overtime, he was the Cavs leading scorer at five. Mitchell had two. Struess had four. Allen had two and and, uh, and St. Merrill led the way with five. One, on, one from three and then one on, on a two-pointer and playing most of overtime. And credit to JB for riding the hot hand there as well. Be remiss not to just say that Donovan Mitchell had a statistically very large game, 37, 6, uh, and only two turnovers for Mitchell. I think some parts of his game were a little off at times, but I think overall 14 to 27 from the field, 4 11 from 3, got to line five times, 37 points is still a big night. And Jared Allen, I think, deserves some a look too. Um, 10 points for him, 6 boards, not a crazy statistical night. But I think positionally, really, really solid. And for me, Evan, I think that's a good way to look at play of the night because my play of the night, Jared Allen, end of regulation, had a defended out Prince Sangoon. Rockets get the ball with seven seconds left. They just give it to Sangoon, let him go at Allen. Allen defended it perfectly, forced a really tough shot, goes to overtime, Cavs win. He was just positionally, I thought, really solid against Sangoon um, in this game. You know, only had a little bit of foul trouble, certainly was limited at times, and that's where Tristan comes in. And plays almost you know twenty minutes, but I thought Allen was really good, and that play of the night for me was was a really nice encapsulation of that. What was your play of the night? Uh, my play of the night was the three pointer. I believe Sam Merrill made like towards the beginning of the overtime period, but that that was the original consideration. But the more the fact that he dove for the ball, like with and about towards the end of the fourth quarter, like when the Cavs were possibly about to turn over the ball, like just seeing a dude who like doesn't play that often, just like be locked in on either end of the floor, and also like was never like touted as the best defensive player because of knee and ankle injuries in college that prevented him from being drafted and like saw him ending up with the Bucks and then being with the Kings and getting cut by the Kings and then um, after having surgery and then working his way up through the charge like just Merrill showing a lot of that hustle and heart that the Cavs kind of needed uh, was really really special in this game um, just like yeah the, the Cavs needed a spark and they're kind of getting it by committee and these last two wins like there's just one guy that kind of serves as the catalyst and i think there's a lot of dudes that were like having like pretty high-end moments all throughout the game but like that that moment was like the crystallization of like yeah this is the guy who's stepping up and like when you i don't know like when you're watching somebody play as like hard as that like if in a, in a team sport situation you, you felt you feel more inclined morale wise to step up to the task and kind of meet them at the summit because they're busting their butt out there why can't you do the same yeah. All right. Let's go to stat of the night for me. Um, Houston shot 47.8% at the rim. That's under 50% at the easy spot on the floor for, for the Cavs to have that defensive performance. I think speaks well of Jared Allen. I think speaks well of what Tristan Thompson gave you. I think speaks well of their defense overall. Certainly, I think some of Houston's players, I'm looking at you, Jalen Green, uh, maybe struggling a little bit to finish struggling a little bit to kind of maximize their spots there. But Allen was really, really good at contesting shots, at denying looks, at being a real presence in the center of the floor, which for a team that is playing a little bit different defensively right now that didn't overall have a good defensive game. Houston had a really good offensive rating in this game, got a ton of offensive rebounds. All of that is true. 
took for a, mo- a ton of their shots at the rim, 42% of their shots at the rim, to end up under 50% from the rim and really not cap. Like, that's where you win the game. In a, in a five point overtime game, that margin where the Cavs were better at defending the rim <coughs> or shooting at the rim, that, that absolutely changed the game. Yeah, um, that, that really was a game changer for me. And my stat is kind of Tristan Thompson related as well. Um, Emi Udoka, to his credit, as frustrating as it can be, did really lean on Hack Thompson in this game. And he was kind of the big reason why the Cavs are so bad at shooting free throws tonight. But they were 22 of 34 from the line. Um, Thompson was, you know, like I said, like the biggest uh, suspect of this when he was 2 of 8 from the line overall. But like, I don't know. It, it's just tough when like you don't have your shooting ops. I mean, and then Jared Allen is 4 of 7 as well. And like, it, it's not great when you look at it from that lens. And, um, that can be a little frustrating, I guess, if you're JB Bickerstaff, just because of the 12 additional points that you left at the line. But going forward, that is something at least worth keeping an eye on because some teams may try to exploit that just to get extra opportunities out of the cab, especially because they are probably going to lean on Tristan Thompson a lot more because Damian Jones just isn't a factor in this rotation and Jared Allen's the only other big otherwise. We'll end this segment on this question. <coughs> what does this game mean for Sam Merrill? For him to have a career high, for him to do what he did, what does this mean for him when when you think about him as part of this Cavs roster, especially with all the injuries right now? Um, he's for sure a guy that like has earned minutes in the rotation going forward, especially with all these injuries. I think it's always tough just because when this team is fully healthy, like you look at him or like guys like Craig Porter Jr. who has played well and like these opportunities because of injuries too. Like these guys probably wouldn't get the shine that they normally would get with the main club. And like Sam Merrill post game is just like, Hey, um, this is a great moment just because like, or Jackson Flickinger asked him and I'm sure Jackson's like the proud dad in the room because he's the biggest Sam Merrill advocate I know. But, um, Jackson asked him, like, hey, yeah, you were right down the road at the Wolves Center all of last season. Um, did you think you'd have a moment like this? And Sam's like, it's just one game, but it's another step forward. And it kind of, like, just reaffirms that, like, I have faith in myself and just who I am as a player. And, um, excuse me, but, yeah, like, just because the Cavs are so just strapped injury-wise rota- in their rotation, and I think... J.B. Bickerstaff admitting like they wanted a little bit more juice offensively heading into the final frame in overtime. And he leaned on Merrill instead of Karis LeVert. Uh, I mean, it's a sign of growth on Bickerstaff's part just because he's leaning on the hot hand instead of what he knows sometimes. And Merrill just responded well. Like, he was a super impactful player for the Cavs. And like, yeah, like you just kind of keep riding this hot hand. If he ever fizzles out, I think it's easier to pull him with a rotation because he's just not like a key guy on a nightly basis for you and you have other options on the roster. But yeah, if he's hot and he has it rolling, like you just keep it going and letting let him letting let him let keeping it fly out there. We will have more on him this week. We're gonna do a whole segment on him, what he is, what the scouting report on him is. We'll do all of that later this week. All right, coming up next though, the injuries. Let's talk about them, where they leave the Cavs, all of that and more. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning any winning $5 money line bet. That is $150 if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So right now, FanDuel.com slash Lockdown, kick off the NFL season, tap into this NBA season. A ton of great offers there all this week, every sport you can want. It's bowl season, it's NBA season, it's NFL season. There's a ton there. That's FanDuel, official partner of the NFL and official sports book of Locked On. So the injuries, in case people just are under a rock, have, have missed this, whatever. Darius Garland yeah, out at least, a, at least a month. Yeah, well, okay, Evan, they spit. Uh, he has a broken jaw, so he's going to be through his Kanye West through the wire era, I would in some way, shape, or form going forward here. And then you're getting Evan Mobley, who is going to have knee surgery to fix an issue at six to eight weeks, so let's just say up to two months. Evan Mobley, who already missed some time with that injury. Evan, I, I just want to note that I remain confounded. Just like I, no one can give me a good answer to this that would I think fully satisfy me. 
But I don't know how Darius Garland like went back into the locker room and then played a whole quarter while suffering after suffering a broken jaw. Like that seems nuts to me. Yeah, um, as someone who slightly fractured their jaw once um, in like late high school or the college times, um, it's not fun at all. Um, like it's incredibly painful. So like I, I just don't know how you do that because he's getting hit like a ton of physicality against the Celtics in that game and like was playing through it and. Um, Chris Fielder Cleveland.com noted like he was spitting blood continuously into a cup after the game all joking around with his teammates and um, some of the folks like just within the Cavs um, were like yeah nobody had an idea that he broke his jaw and then like he woke up the next day I guess in a lot of pain and they got it looked at and it's like oh yep that, that's a fracture um, that's gonna do it so yeah he was sitting courtside for the game um couldn't tell if he was talking or not, or if his jaw was wired shut yet, just because of the surgery. I, don't, like, I know Brian Windhorst had reported he was getting surgery done this week. I don't know if that meant Monday or at some point this week. Um, so we'll see. Uh, the, yeah. Um, you had mentioned it's like his Kanye West era. I hope it's that's the only one he goes through and he doesn't go too far down the rabbit hole. But um, yeah, I meant like that, early like, fun. I meant early like like good Kanye West or yeah. Yeah. He made graduation, man. He made wolves. But either way, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's just the, the injuries stink. I think they hurt or the blow felt even harder just because like the Cavs um, had lost three in a row, two kind of frustrating losses to Boston, the latest one being like the more frustrating of the bunch. You and I are both like dumbfounded by how poor the Cavs looked in that game. Um, but like just getting that news and seeing it hit back to back on a Friday, like that was just really unfortunate timing. And I thought like, okay, well, the Cavs are still too talented to tank. They have Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen, but this certainly changes the trajectory of the season. I still feel that it changes the trajectory of this season, but at least for now with like these two wins that they put together at home, at least make, it makes you feel a little bit better. And the fact that like, okay, they're not. I'm going to be gunning for the first overall pick this year, guys, but they may, you know, just not fight. They'll be, they'll be fighting to get back into the Eastern Conference playoff hunt if things get a little dicey as time goes on. They're they're in a spot now where these injuries are just going to make the up to the next two months, I think, a really a huge challenge. Like, there's just no way around that. The fact that they are missing someone who is integral to their defensive philosophy and plays a role in offense, and I think it's had it's someone you need and want to get minutes for and develop. That's a big deal. Then you're getting the guy who's the, the lead orchestrator of your offense. He's going to be off the floor, and mm-hmm. it's just banged up and all this. And it just it adds more confusion to what has already been, I think, something of a confusing season. This is two months where you're going to have to take, like, you can look at the overall success of the team, and that's going to have an impact on what happens and what doesn't at the deadline and all that stuff. But at the same time, you're in a spot where like you're gathering information on what the core of this team looks like together is now taken away from you. I don't think that's helpful. I'm sh- that's the, the most important thing is the health and all of that. But that's part of this too. It's in terms of roster building, this is a really cr- this is a pretty inopportune time if you're just trying to assess this roster and figure some of what is coming here out. I, that mm-hmm. that's not again the first thing, but that came to mind to me when we were thinking about this. And it's also inopportune timing wise in terms of what Evan Mobley is as a player because that puzzle still isn't completely solved because sure he's showing you otherworldly stuff again defensively but like offensively you're kind of like left wanting a little bit more some nights and then there's other nights where like he's absolutely dominant and you see like the vision of him being <clears throat> Cleveland's like top dog uh towards the end of the season if he had remained healthy or um at least heading into next year as well um so like the, that raises some flags for me and gives me pause obviously like a big man having to have knee surgery i know it's just to remove like a loose body so that could be tissue bone uh cartilage anything um so like that that's going to give me pause no matter what and you knock on wood and hope this is the only time evan mobley's knee becomes an issue but yeah uh the Cavs could be in a much different state or place in those one and a half to two months mobley's out in the month maybe a little bit more that Garland is out too. And like the, the Cavs could be in a much different spot between now and then. So who, who knows ultimately what will happen. Uh, but yeah, like you said, like from a team optic standpoint, it, it just creates more questions about what this team is and how like lacking they are just with two integral players. And then on a personal level, like in, to the Garland side of things, like 
he and Mitchell were starting to seem like to put it together on offense and like kind of figure out like how to play in harmony with one another again instead of this year turn my turn basketball and that's hit that has to hit pause for a little bit until the Cavs can or to ride out the storm and wait for Garland to recover. So like there's just a lot of unfortunate things that come with these injuries and just the length of them is we're gonna have more on this this week. We're gonna do how the Cavs adjust to life without Garland and who steps up in his absence. We're gonna talk about the Mobley part of it. So more to come in detail on this in our next episode of Locked on Cavs. For this one, though, I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Darrell. Thanks again to Jake Stevens. As always, talk to you guys next time. <laughs>